glad you saw what happened. Would you describe what you saw? You were sitting in the first row. Well, I was sitting in the front row, and I heard a commotion behind me at the back of the hall, and as I turned to look at what was going on in the back, I saw two, uh, two not very tall Negro men rush forward. They came all the way to the stage, and I think they were even touching the stage, and both of them pumped bullets into Malcolm X, who was sitting alone on a row of chairs about to speak. He was about to begin to speak. And they ran forward, you saw them run they forward? Ran forward, exactly. They ran forward and they both shot Malcolm, and then they turned around very quickly and they dashed from the room. And everyone was screaming and so surprised by what happened that nobody rushed out to seize these men. And as I turned, I tried to follow them all the way to the back of the room, and then I lost sight of them. What was your immediate reaction? That this was a horrible and outrageous thing, and it took five full minutes for the police to arrive on the scene. This I see no excuse for, whatever. Were you afraid at the time it happened? I was not afraid at all. What did you do? Scramble for the... I, I tried to see if I could be helpful, but I realized the men were away by then, and I just went to the floor like everybody else. Like everybody else. Did you see what happened, no, sir? I just arrived. No. Well, I know exactly I didn't see, but I see two men rushing me to the, to the platform, and... First, uh, somebody said, take your hand out of my pocket, and uh, everybody started gazing at the people who they was talking to, and Brother Malcolm said, be quiet, be cool, you know, and as that happened, I heard gunshots, so everybody, I looked at see Malcolm went back forward, falling, grabbing his side, thing, but two guys ran up here and opened up on him, and he fell backwards, but I didn't know he was hit until I see him falling like that, grabbing himself and I know that he was shooting at Malcolm. I see him that he fall. But uh, other than that, I see two guys running through the door, firing. I don't know if he was, it's about four of them, I don't know, who had guns, seemed like it. Did, what happened, sir? Oh, no. Did you see what happened there? No, 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 no. They could have reached out and fought. Not exactly. No, I just came in when it all happened. I, all I could see was uh, smoke and shooting. And then the, the policeman, I, uh, uh, what did you see happen? I saw two men in the shooting. Uh, that is, uh, the smoke, the after effects of the shooting, as I, as I was entering into the uh, ballroom. Uh, and so then I uh, ran outside and I accosted the police officer and then he responded and he came in the, toward the back of the, the room. So then I continued on down the street and I got another police officer. And by this time, there were two or three cars there uh, outside. And then... Uh, Did you see any of the shooting at all? Uh, just uh, the after effects of the shooting, the smoke. And Did you see anyone running away? Oh, yes, but I didn't realize that, you know, that this was the person that was shooting, if it was. Well, what made you aware that there was shooting in here? I if heard, you... Because I heard the, the shooting itself. I heard the sound of the... Uh, I think I heard two, maybe three shots. Uh, and then there you immediately recognized it as gunfire. Right, uh, that's right. Because I was sort of anticipating or expecting this uh, something to happen because of the the bombing of his house uh, uh, last week or so, whatever happened. And so you ran away. Well, no, I ran out to get help. <laughs> what happened, Miss? Yes. Tell me about it. Well, it was a certain uh, noise, and then. Um, the two fellas, one was a black Muslim, and I don't know who the other one was because I didn't see him, ran and started shooting, and everybody black fell to the floor. Yes, sir. They were black Muslims. Yes, sir. They were black Muslims. Was that recognized? Hey, uh, Benjamin. Uh, my name is Sharon 6 x Shabar, and um, he got shot in his face and three times in the chest. And I don't, I don't know what else happened. Could you give me your impressions? I know it's difficult for you to remember right now, but try to remember just exactly what happened. Well, he had just got up to open up, and um, he was speaking. I don't remember exact words he was saying. And all of a sudden, uh, they were in the middle aisle there because everybody turned around because they made, they jumped up like they was drunk. Somebody was drunk or something, and the brothers ran, and they ran toward the front and started shooting, and everybody fell to the floor. The same guys that created the disturbance ran towards the front? Yes, they ran towards the front, and they started shooting. And it was, I guess it was pistols, because... And then they sh shot, shot him four times. I have the impression that I saw someone running out shooting. Do you, do you remember that too, or? I don't remember anything. I just saw 
and I looked up. I was laying on the side, and I uh, recognized one of them. The one that had on the brown suit is, is a black Muslim. If he's not registered, he, he, he's down there in number seven. Thank you, Sharon. You're welcome. I see what happened. Did you? All right. May I get uh, out of what happened here today? What did you see? No, no, we are uh, talking a little something here. What, what happened, sir? Did you see? How it happened? Yeah, I saw what happened. There was a, an old army trick. I was sitting right by this man here, I think. Two guys said, uh, once you get out of my pocket, it's, a, it's sort of a psychological condition and reflex. This had happened before, actually. It seemed like every meeting I've noticed someone said, some, some disturbance started in the back. And Malcolm says, quiet, what's going on by the back there? And this sort of conditions the people to look back when something started. And the same thing happened today. And when it said, get out of my pocket, it started for a while, everyone looked back. All faces went back to the side, and the guy ran up, seemed like he had something over his head like this. And he shot Malcolm, he fell back. I didn't see him this time he was shot. Did you see what happened after Malcolm fell? Uh, well, everyone hit the floor, and uh, he came back shooting down the aisle. It looked like it. Oh, he ran out shooting. Like he was shooting as he was going out. So he tried uh, to... I can't understand why is only one cop was outside, stationed out the door. Most of the time when we have meeting, a gang of cops. So it's automatically, it's our enemies set it up to make, our, make black people fight among themselves. That's what I think it was. Are there any other eyewitnesses? I'd like to get an eyewitness account of what happened. Did you see what happened? Mm -hmm. Yes. I was sitting up in the front, that's about all. Well, you must have uh, heard the shots at least. Yeah, I went uh, said somebody was going into his pocket. I jumped up and ran, and Brother Malcolm told me, hold it, hold your seat, don't be alarmed. And um, we turned around, looked at Brother Malcolm, and they, they started with it. They started gunning at him. It was a police fault. They didn't have the proper uh, bodyguards or anything down there to, to stop these new guys from coming in here. And um, there's negligence on the police department as well. It holds back there where those bullets were made. Why don't you go back there and see if any bullets back there? Let's see what happened. Uh, no, I, I was back here. I was setting up uh, chain of command. Uh, I didn't see anything. No. Chain of command? Yeah, that's right. For what? Change in post. Oh, I see. You were one of Malcolm's guards. That's right. And you didn't see what happened? No, I didn't. I heard the shots. I ran forward. I saw Malcolm hold his side and hold his stomach and fell down. How do you feel now? I want to kill somebody. That's right. I want to kill somebody. Before the night's over, if Malcolm dies, somebody going to die. No religion in the world would blind Malcolm from seeing the injustices that black people were suffering from. He knew that by taking on the government that was mistreating his people was the proper thing any oppressed person should do. Any other option was cowardice in the face of the enemy. He vowed to himself that he would do all in his power to bring about freedom to black people, whatever the cost. Malcolm knew that if other black men wouldn't stand up and be the man that he was being, the oppressive system wouldn't feel compelled to give black people not even the smallest demand. It was stand up or lay down. And Malcolm wasn't going to wait until some god came and fabricated himself into a molecular structure to exact revenge on someone oppressing him. No, no religion in the world was going to handcuff Malcolm. White America's biggest fear was to have other black people thinking like Malcolm. If the power structure was frightened of Malcolm now, one could imagine how it would feel if Malcolm wasn't under the restriction of Elijah Muhammad. Uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and they start setting up a thing against Malcolm. And I could see this, but most others couldn't. But I didn't say anything, because I figured that's Mal between Malcolm and Mr. Muhammad. I ain't got nothing to do with that, right? But then brothers, Arthur 14X, Charles 24X, uh, and Charles 24X worked behind the counter in Temple Number no. 7 restaurant. So he was very, very influential. 
yeah, Big Red, I always knew he was against the messenger. You could always talk about it. And he started spreading this. Well, still, that didn't bother me. Then he started talking about, yeah, they ought to kill him. Kill Red, kill Red, kill Big Red, yeah. So I said, uh-oh, this is getting serious. But still, I didn't say anything. Oh, again, it's not my business, right? And I was a lieutenant. So whatever that came from Chicago, I went along with. But then I said, wait a minute, now John Ali is spreading this venom. Uh, brothers is talking up this crap down in the, in the restaurant. So when they start killing it, start talking about killing him, he should be killed, and this, that, and the other. <coughs> I said, wait a minute, let me give him a call. So I called him, and uh, I spoke to Sister Betty. And I said, uh, tell my brother that, uh, to be very careful. And she said, for what? I said, just tell him to be careful. I said, of course, it was light at the time. Then this thing started getting heavy. Talking about, yeah, he should be off. He's against the messenger. He's a traitor, blah, blah, blah. And I saw no justification for this. I said, okay, he made an unfortunate choice of words. If Mr. Muhammad told him not to say this, and he said it, he gets busted. I mean, 90 days he'll be back. But then I could see things shaping up. I said, he ain't never coming back to the mosque. He got him out. I didn't understand why. And I noticed Joseph. I worked in a newspaper office because I was also the circulation manager of the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. And Joseph would come in, and it was whispering, and this, that, and Maceo, who was the secretary, whispering, and John Ali came in, and the whispering. I said, oh, there's something, there's some doo-doo in the game somewhere. <clears throat> so I called up again. I said, tell my brother to be very, very, very careful. She said, you want to speak to him? I said, no. Because it was against the law to speak to anybody in Class C. I called up the third time, and he took the phone from Betty. He said, look, brother, if you got something to say, say it. And I said, well, I'm just telling you, brother, be very careful. He said, why? I said, the brothers are going around talking about killing you. He said, ain't nobody going to kill me. He said, brother, I gave 12 years of my life to the mosque. I said, hey, I'm just telling you what they said. This talk of murder inside Temple No. 7's restaurant among the brothers was outrageous. Author 14X, Charles 24X, John Ali, Maceo X, and Captain Joseph sat and broke bread and began to plant seeds by speaking ill of the nation's most loyal and faithful minister. John Ali began acting strange right after the bossy postal incident in 1958 and many suspected that Ali was then recruited as an FBI informant around that time. The talk of murdering Minister Malcolm was unbelievable. Had it been approved by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, or was it instigated by double agents working for the government? Now, back at Moss Number 7, Malcolm didn't know who had his back, and it was getting frightening. Malcolm now had to watch his every move, because now he didn't know where the knife would be coming from. It got real scary. At Moss number seven, home was where the hatred was. There were some workings going on in Chicago as well as New York, Philadelphia, not Boston, Jersey that um, wanted to unseat the brother. And they planned to, and they, this, is, this was a step for them to do this, to get rid of him, because they were fear of this man that if anything happened to Elijah Muhammad, they knew that he would be next in line. Bossy detective Tony Ulasowicz now had on his side his number one asset. Now a major plan was being assembled to rid the world of its black messiah. Meanwhile, within the nation of Islam, Malcolm began to notice that many brothers and sisters began shunning him like a sneezing patient inside a crowded doctor's office. Every little thing that you could bring up against the brother that would put him, to make him look bad, or to make him not to be accepted among the, br the brothers, it was there. It was a brother, and I remember there was a situation over in, in Philadelphia where some brothers over there was hard on him because he broke up their little hustle down there in, in the mosque. They had a dope thing down there in the mosque where uh, Omar 
who was uh, who was the minister there, and Omar was just terrible. He'd have brothers out on the street selling papers, while he'd be laying up with the brothers old ladies. Oh, this brother just went ridiculous with his thing. Then the situation that that other incident they had down in Washington D.C. where the brother caught uh, Minister Lucius with his woman, and he had. The brother was so upset, he took the sister down there in the basement and throwed her in the furnace. Oh, it's it, it, every little thing they could bring up against the brother, if the brother would, and 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 Yusuf, little, that little Popeye, that brother, Yusuf, he, that brother's sturdy trick knowledge, he, he was a master at trick knowledge. And because that brother, he used to, that brother used to, if brothers would come in from uh, on a long showman's, would come in, and they'd come to the, and if their pockets was right, they'd give Yusuf a nice taste. You know Bumpy Johnson? Bumpy knew who the people were. And I remember he came to Malcolm and said, listen, we know who it is that's following you. You want us to take care of him? And Malcolm said no, because he said he didn't want his people to get killed. That's the kind of person he was. So Bumpy had to back off. But that's the kind of times we were living in at that particular time. It was a letter from Muhammad's Mosque Number 7, and the letter stated that Malcolm was to turn over all property and effects belonging to Mosque Number 7, including his house, effective immediately. Jealousy abounds forever in our race, brother. That brother come from nowhere and do all the things he did. Think about this. And some of those some of the brothers you're talking about had been in the mosque since the beginning. And here Malcolm come out of nowhere. They couldn't accomplish what he did. And he did it. People responded to it. Some people loved him and some hated him. A bureau operator informed key Nation of Islam participants that they could proceed with their plan for February 21, 1965. Permission was granted. There would be no interference from governmental sources. The operator suggested to the participants to place ads in their own newspaper announcing events to be held at the Autobahn Ballroom by Moss Number 7. The operator further suggested that the rented out ballroom be used to rehearse the main event to ensure its success. Nation of Islam participants, completely blinded by their emotionalism and hate for Brother Malcolm, couldn't foresee that by placing ads in their very own newspaper, holding events in the ballroom, would soon directly link them to Malcolm's murder. February 13, 1965. It was late in the evening and the Shabazz family was about to retire for the night. Malcolm had spent the whole day trying to put into motion the necessary building blocks that would cement and strengthen his organization into the tall, towering edifice that it should be. His legal battles with the Nation of Islam, who were trying to take his home, exhausted him even further. A night of restful sleep was desperately needed. A restful, uninterrupted sleep was all the champion warrior needed to continue his next battle. While people in the community may look at the black Muslims 
as a religious and a spiritual body. They are not looked upon like that in the eyes of the law enforcement agency. The brothers are just like, I think it's like anything else. Just face it, the black Muslim was a gangster organization. You may not like this, and I hope I don't hurt none of your feelings. I hope they ain't doing the same thing, but I know they are if they're going to survive. Every time there was a rally where the lamb was coming to the rally, it was a known fact that every brother had to show up with at least the hundred dollars to walk down that aisle to lay on that table. And whatever city that was in, you bet your life. You had uh, you didn't have to be no great uh, Scotland Yard or FBI reporter. It was a lot of robbing went on in that town that night for that Sunday's rally. Okay. What it was a number joint or whatever. It was some robbing because some brothers wanted that money to lay on that table to give to the land. All right? Do, let me tell you one thing. Do in the great, after the death of Malcolm and after the death of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they had a thing going on in this city called selling the fish. There was more coke sold during that time. The coke was coming in in the fish. Brother, let me, let me say this. <laughs> I love to see a strong brother. I, it, I, I, listen, I don't try to do anything to break a brother's spirit, and I hope I haven't said it, but I know I have, because I know you. The Muslims, and I'm not saying because I, I dislike them, I don't dislike them, but I dislike the dirty things that they have done to their sisters and brothers. While them, while that elite, them niggas lived off of their sisters and brothers, buying them mink stove, they used to tell us, they used to be so hard on the brother having a dog. <laughs> and, they, and, the, and the royal family had dogs. They had everything they wanted. The attempt to burn to death Malcolm and his entire family was despicable. The shameful act had many in black communities throughout the world who had once admired the Muslim organization turning their backs in disgust. The word being whispered on the street was that the deed was done by known thugs in the organization like Alvin X. Walcott, brother of Minister Louis X. of the Boston Mosque, Thomas 15X Johnson, known for committing acts of extreme deadly violence, Norman 3X Butler, the karate expert and strong arm enforcer known for his violent assaults, and Joseph X. Gravitt, captain of Moss No. 7, who was known for his early failed attempt of trying to get someone to wire Malcolm's car with explosives. All black men who were quick to maim or kill members of their own race, but were cowards when facing hostile white races. A lot of people say a lot of things. But in their heart, they got something else in mind. I was surprised when I found out who it was. But nonetheless, what they, they did, well, like I said, it devastated me. Because I was with Malcolm quite closely in the mosque, and I got to respect him very much. And those brothers that did it, 
I had spoken to some of them when they first came into Mars. And then when I found out who did it, I was very much surprised. A lot of the misunderstandings come from not knowing the internal workings of the nation, right? The internal workings of the nation, you had to be in the nation to really understand them or be a student of it. <clears throat> and uh, otherwise, you don't understand what was. For instance, I knew a meeting. Ain't, ain't nobody in the nation gonna go out with a national and do anything. They'll put on a rosary, put his cap on backwards, put a cigar in his mouth, go punch somebody in the mouth. And when the police catch him, he'll say, Hail Mary, Mother of God, blessed art thou among women, blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, holy Mary, thou. I say, what's your religion? I'm Catholic. I go to St. Thomas. He ain't going to identify himself as a, as a nation. Malcolm knows that time is running out. He wonders if the people know the depth of the damage done to them. He wonders if they understand how the system of oppression really operates, if they have an idea how big the monster has grown. He's heard their accolades, heard thunderous applause, and for him there's no vanity. He wondered if he has made it plain enough the complexity of what he has learned from revolutionary philosopher Franz Fanon that we must abandon manufactured Western mindsets that are preventing us from being ourselves. He wondered if a slumbering giant can, without him, shake itself to wakefulness. He wondered if the people ever fathomed the thought that possibly one day they could face extinction. He wondered if by the year 2020, blacks would be in worse condition than they were in in 1965. He wondered if anyone really understood. Intelligence gathering has now revealed that there will be many people calling in sick on the day of the assassination. There will be no searching at the door and other security measures will be from weak to non-existent. Malcolm stood behind the podium and uh, he arranged his papers there on the, and he said, Salaam Alaikum, brothers and sisters, and we all answered, Wa Alaikum, uh, Wa Alaikum Salaam, or we answered him back. At that point, there was a loud crash and the noise came right near where I was seen. I swung around and the whole audience swung around and Several chairs had been knocked over, and two men were standing. One man was facing a second man. The second man was, was crouched by, with his hand in his pocket. And the first guy was saying, Nigga, get your hand out of my pocket. And at that point, it's dawn, something just said to me, Something's wrong here. And I swung around to Malcolm because I knew Malcolm was on the stage by himself. I don't know whether I had a premonition or what, but I, something just said, watch everything. Something's happening here. As I swung around, Malcolm stepped out from behind the podium, took one step toward the stage, leaned forward and says, cool it, brothers and sisters. Those were his exact words, cool it, brothers and sisters. And as he leaned back, his hand was up like this, one finger, and he straightened up. And that's when he heard this boom. The shotgun went off. It sounded like some kind of an explosion, you know. The sound of a shotgun in a closed area like that would have a different sound than if you heard a shotgun fired out of doors. It was a boom like sound. And so I saw Malcolm when he got hit. And like I said, he had his finger up in there and he was bringing his hand down like this. And when this hit him, he, his hand shot back up in the air like this. And he stood there like this. And then I began to hear shots that were coming from revolvers, you know, but coming fast. Blah, 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 blah. 
And I remember as I sat there saying to myself, why don't they stop shooting? If they would stop shooting, he might survive this. Because I could tell that the bullets were hitting him. It wasn't like people were shooting at each other. They were shooting at him. Because he was standing there like he was transfixed. You know, just frozen. And suddenly, he just toppled over backwards. And what was so strange about it, he didn't crumple, he didn't sag at the knees, he just went over backwards, rigid. His head hit the floor first, the back of his head, with a thud. A sound that I said, well, if he survived those bullets, the blow to the back of his head would have had to have crushed his skull and that would kill him. That's when I felt that Malcolm was dead. But the bullets then started again. The shooting started up again. There was a lull, a brief lull, and it started up again. And that's when, no, before the second, uh, before he fell, I noticed that across the top of the stage where the curtains are drawn, they come together like this, there were like flash bulbs popping off and off and on. And at first I thought because the light from these, these lights that I saw going across, back and forth, just running across the stage, back and forth, like a whole series of flash bulbs were going off. And then another set would come go off. And it was like they were just running back and forth like this. My first reaction was, they're firing at him from above. And then in the split side, I said, no, it can't be because the, when a gun is fired, when the gases are escaping from the muzzle of the gun, there's a bright flame that comes off, and it's not that yellowish color. I didn't think so. It wasn't that kind of color I was seeing. The second thought I had was, they're taping this. And you know, it was like a cold chill. I said, they're making a movie of this. And by this time, then Malcolm was flat, and the firing was going on. And I couldn't understand why they were still firing because his feet were up like this. And from where I was seated, like the floor level being lower than the stage, all I could see were his shoes, the soles of his shoes. But the men who were firing into his body were standing up, so they were firing, you know, uh, they, could, they were firing at an angle into his body. But from the bottom, you know, the bullets were going from the bottom, going up into his body. And that continued for a few seconds. And I again thought, why don't they stop shooting? Why are they continuing to shoot? The man is obviously dead. And then the shooting stopped. Now, when I saw the two men who made the commotion, when I swung around to uh, watch Malcolm, they were out of my range of vision. So I can't say what happened with them. I didn't see them. Some, it said they ran up the center aisle firing. I didn't see it. But I do know uh, that I heard the shotgun go off. And then within seconds, the other weapons were, you could hear them going off. It sounded to me like when we used to go up on the rifle range, we had formed, uh, 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 later on we formed a rifle and pistol club, and when several people would be on the firing line shooting at the same time, it would remind me of the shooting that took place when Malcolm was gunned down. You know, just a whole bedlam of firing going on, just, you know, deafening. So uh, the firing stopped. Just before the firing stopped, somebody in the seat with me, because I sat, everybody immediately when the first shot ran, ducked under the table. And I'm sitting on the last seat, facing the seat, watching everything. And I had said to myself, see, you're like, just take in everything that you can. Remember this. So I'd have a clear memory of what I was seeing happening. Somebody grabbed me and said, get under the table, get under here, you, you, you know like concern for my safety. So I came down and went under the table, but I deliberately went in feet first with my head out. Now I'm on the floor and I'm looking across 
and all I can see are chairs knocked over. Every chair is down. And right across from me in the center aisle, there were three men standing. They were standing in a row, one behind the other. The first one, as I recall, seemed to be the taller of the two. He had on something, a hat looked like a, uh, some sort of a cap. He had on a coat that came down, I would say like a, what do we call it, a quarter length coat that came down just above his knees. Not, it didn't cover his knees. And his hand, his right hand, was hanging down at his side, and it was some sort of weapon he was holding in his hand. I can't be clear whether now, whether it was a sort of shotgun, whether it was a pistol, but it was a weapon of some kind. It was kind of large. It was like when the sound of the shooting stopped, everything froze. There was no movement. It was the most eerie thing, the total silence. And then these men, as though somebody had given a signal, started running toward the rear. And they would leap, hopping over chairs and people. And I watched them as they got all the way down towards the exit door and started to turn to go up. Just before that, I heard shots ring out again. Pop, pop, pop. I can't remember how many. Uh, and then they disappeared from sight. They turned and went out the door, which would have led to the steps going down out of the ballroom. Then I got up, and by this time, people were beginning to get up to their, get to their feet, and there was a whole lot of confusion and noise. Uh, I looked up at the stage. I saw the people on the stage. I saw Betty. I saw Yuri and the other people, and some of them I couldn't recognize. And at first, I started, and I said, no, I, there's nothing I can do to help him. He's dead. I had seen those men go out, and I said, let me follow and see what, if, uh, you know, what happened with them. So I followed behind and took the they had taken. I went out, went down the stairs, and I came out of the building. I noticed to my right a whole group of people. They had this brother up in the air like they were trying to pull him apart. And the police were struggling to try to break into that crowd and get the guy away. And so a, a cop fired a shot. I remember a shot being fired, and that made the police were able to get to this man. They took him. I later learned that that was Hager. And they put him in the police car and drove off. They drove to the corner and turned and out of sight. I then walked down to the corner of um, Broadway at 165th Street, and I stood there by this pharmaceutical store. They had all kinds of pharmaceutical devices and things orthopedic uh, uh, equipment and so on in the windows. And I, on that corner, I could look right across into Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And <clears throat> I was standing there when they brought Malcolm by. But before they brought Malcolm by, uh, a police car came from down Broadway turned into 165th Street and stopped right on that corner, sort of parked at an angle, just standing there. And a policeman got out and went down to where the crowd was with this brother. And then I saw this man coming back, and he was escorting some guy who was wearing a uh, fez with a lot of gold braid with the, the uh, the moon and the star, the, the Islamic symbol, but all in gold braid, very much like the kind of uh, uh, kufi that uh, Elijah Muhammad used to wear. And this policeman, and the man was bent over, he had on an overcoat. And obviously he was in uh, distress. And I use that word because I had not yet seen the extent of his problem. The officer opened the rear door, put the man in the back seat, assisted him in the car, closed the door, and he got in the front seat. I'm standing there against the wall of this building on the corner. They hadn't noticed me because the sidewalk was fairly wide at that point, maybe, what, 10, 12, 15 feet wide, very wide sidewalk. I walked over because I thought that 
the guy that they had put in the car was one of the members of the OAAU. For some reason, I thought it was uh, Brother Willie who had been on duty at the, uh, at the top of the stairs when I had come into the uh, place. And after having heard the, the firing as the guys were coming out, I thought maybe somebody else had been shot. And I thought maybe it was the three men getting away, shooting at people who were in their way, blocking their escape. So I walked over to the car, and I put my head in the window because the window was down, and I leaned over and looked in the face of this man. And he was in extreme agony, holding himself at the middle like he might have been shot or having a severe stomach cramp. But something, whatever the injury was, had to do with his midsection. It was somebody I'd never seen before in my life. And as I think about it, the brother had a um, kind of an olive-like complexion, like uh, somebody from the Middle East or an Oriental kind of coloring. But I'd never seen him before. And as I raised up, and I'm saying, who is you know, I think it. But, you know, these policemen, the driver, and the other, they never noticed me. Obviously, they were so concerned with what they were doing. And the officer in the passenger side who put the man back said to the driver, get out of here. He pulled, he went down 165th Street. Now, that puzzled me because I thought, that what they were doing, was I knowing how police arrest people, what they do, I knew right away that this man was not under arrest, but he was being, uh, I thought he was being immediately carried someplace for attention to the hospital. And so I expected them to just con complete a U-turn and go right over to Presbyterian uh, Hospital, Columbia Presbyterian, and take him there because that's where they took Malcolm. After they drove off, then they brought Malcolm out on a stretcher, and I watched, and I stood there and watched as he, as they passed and took him over there. But they went the other direction, and they went past the hundred. Uh, let's see, it was hundred sixty fifth Street. They went past Audubon Ball, uh, Audubon Avenue, and went down that hill. And I'm saying, well, where are they taking this man? And then the brothers came out, and the police taking Malcolm across the street, so, and all, of, and then people began to spill out of the place, and so, and all of that, I just uh, let that go. I didn't follow up on it. I'm still thinking that this is one of our people who got injured when the, these guys were escaping, and there, there'd been some firing, and then this, this person had been shot. Uh, so I didn't think any more about it. When the early edition of the paper came out, New York Times and the other papers, they said that two people had been arrested and a reporter, a young sister whose name, I can't recall at the moment, but I have it, I can give it to you. In her paper, she was writing for the New York Post. They also came out with the supporting statement that there were two people arrested. When the late edition of the paper came out, it had changed, and it said only one person had been arrested, and that there was a mix-up. The reason that it was assumed, and the police had said two people were arrested, one person who was, the person who had been rescued and, and pulled away from the crowd, it seems as though Two separate reports were given of this man being arrested. That's what the police were saying to explain this thing, you know, this discrepancy. But this sister told me herself later on that she had been called up on the carpet and told that when the 11 o'clock edition of the paper came out, this was about 10 o'clock, and she even mentioned the name of the, uh, of the reporter, that the headline of the New York Times is going to be there was only one person arrested. And she got into some trouble around so you need to look this sister up and talk to her. But I, can, I think I can give you her name. Uh, I think I have it down someplace. Anyhow, uh, so I went on for the next few months 
thinking that it was this brother, Willie, because I heard that he had been shot in the stomach and had been taken to the hospital, to Presbyterian Hospital. And so I, you know, I guess I, I didn't want to make anything big out of it. So I said, oh yeah, right, that's who I saw. And uh, <clears throat> I just didn't recognize him. He was in such pain. And, and then uh, the police probably went around the corner and came back, or uh, maybe they took him to Mother Cabrini Hospital, which is two or three blocks away. And so I put it out of my mind, you know. I think it was sometime in July. It was summer now, July the same year. There was a rally on the corner of 25th Street and 7th Avenue. And I was standing on the fringes of the crowd as if speakers were talking. I can't remember what it was, but there were always rallies going on about some cause or other in Harlem. So there was nothing unusual about that. I look up the street and I see Brother Willie approaching me. And I said, hey, Brother Willie, brother, how you doing, man? Yeah, he says, I'm doing fine, brother. I said, uh, I understand because they had put it in the I said, yeah, I understand the police, uh, the FBI was very interested in you. They had a, them stationed around your bed all the while you were in there. He said, yeah, man, they were really trying to, in, you know, make me send blah, blah, blah. I said, but then he said, they didn't get anything out of me. And then he told me how he got shot and so on. I said, yeah, man. I saw you when the police uh, to put you in the car. He said, what? He said, I walked over to the hospital. I said, what? He said, yeah, I walked over to the hospital. Nobody took me. Well, the, it was like somebody poured cold water on me. I realized then what I had seen, that I had actually seen the second person that the police had picked up but had never made a report on. You know, and this person didn't look anything like uh, Brother Willie. The complexion was different and everything. But I was trying to make it be somebody. You know, I'm trying to fit this into something that makes sense. You know, I had no other explanation for it. Because it looked to me like the police were helping this guy. You know. And so uh, that came as a great shock to me. And that's when I began to stop talking to people about it. And I began to just go over in my mind what I had seen. The man that appeared to be wounded, holding his abdomen in intense pain, that OAAU member Herman Ferguson saw being assisted into a squad car by police, was none other than Clarence 2X Gill. Clarence 2X Gill was a bodyguard of boxing champion Muhammad Ali. Clarence 2X Gill was also captain of Moss No. 11 in Boston. Minister of Moss No. 11 was Louis X. Captain Gill was known and feared for his propensity for extreme violence that he administered on Nation of Islam members that were accused of being delinquent in their duties. Duties such as failing to sell enough Muhammad Speaks newspapers, quitting the organization, and other membership obligations. Captain Gill was a highly dictatorial captain who completely abused his power and authority, and he was feared by everyone. He was known for even torturing men in the basement of his mosque. Clarence 2X Gill was inside the Autobahn ballroom with his second backup team of assassins to assist in the assassination if needed. Malcolm's bodyguard, Reuben Francis, shot and wounded assassin Thomas Hayer of Team A. Gill attempted to protect Hayer and drew his own weapon on Francis and fired, missing Francis. Francis fired at Gill, hitting him in the lower abdomen. When the two wounded assassins attempted to escape, they were pounced on by Malcolm's followers. Uniformed police officers were hiding in and outside of the building then sprung into action to rescue their fallen cohorts. The first of the assassins to be shot by Reuben Francis was Thomas Hayer. Hayer, a member of the Nation of Islam's Moss No. 26 in Newark, New Jersey, was a karate expert. Hayer, who was 22 years old at the time of Malcolm's assassination, was under the command of Lieutenant Linwood X. Linwood X is the Nation of Islam member who came to the Autobahn Ballroom wearing a Nation of Islam national lapel pin, which was 
one of several diversionary tactics employed that day. The tactic was to divert attention to himself from Malcolm's security men, while others who participated in the murder employed other interference tactics. Obviously appearing to be a member of the Nation of Islam, Lieutenant Limwood is asked by Malcolm's security detail, why was he present? Limwood replied that he was fed up with the teachings of the Nation of Islam and came to hear Malcolm's program. Limwood was asked to remove his lapel pin and take a seat. The second assassin shot, Clarence 2X Gill, bodyguard of Muhammad Ali and captain of Lewis X's Moss Number 11 in Boston, came to the Autobahn Ballroom wearing a gold embroidered fez and packing a pistol. After being shot, Gill was escorted to a police car and driven over the George Washington Bridge to the agreed meeting point, which was a private airstrip where a private plane was on standby to complete the getaway. All the assassins were then flown to a hideaway house in Miami, Florida. Lieutenant Linwood X returns to New Jersey and his assassination team minus the captured Thomas Hayden are in flight to Miami. Wounded and bleeding from a gunshot wound, Captain Clarence 2X Gill is in flight with the New Jersey team while his backup team members return to Boston. On standby with orders to terminate the target in the event the subject made it out of the building alive was team number three who was stationed secretly in various hidden locations across the street from the ballroom. Nothing was left to chance. On this chosen day, the Black Messiah wouldn't be allowed to survive. In June of 1965, an anonymous letter was mailed to the Suffolk County Superior Court Probation Department disclosing information stating that Clarence Gill was a participant in the murder of Malcolm X. The letter discloses Gill's whereabouts, yet no attempt to arrest Gill is made by the authorities. New York's Herald Tribune newspaper points out in an article that two suspects were rescued by the police, but in a late edition of the paper, the story is changed to mention the rescue of only one suspect. It is clear that a cover story is being fabricated and that the police are in on the assassination plot along with members of the Nation of Islam. On March 4th, 1965, the New York Journal American newspaper ran an article pointing out that the Nation of Islam rented out the Autobahn Ballroom to rehearse the brutal assassination of Malcolm X. A statement by a high police official states that, quote, Except for the mishap of one man getting shot before he can make it to the door, their plan worked smoothly, almost perfectly, unquote. Mohammed Speaks newspaper even ran ads in their own paper announcing events that were held inside the Autobahn Ballroom. After the assassination, no other events by the Nation of Islam were ever held in the building. Nation of Islam members had ample time to thoroughly familiarize themselves with the entire layout of the ballroom. The reward for the removal of the Black Messiah was a handsome monetary award and a free pass from government harassment from the moment the hit was carried out until perpetuity. The betrayers in Malcolm's organization were also rewarded. Reuben was in the Audubon ballroom, a bodyguard, the only bodyguard that Malcolm had. You know, I don't know why a man gets killed and everybody want to say, I was his bodyguard. That's saying I was a failure. I mean, that don't make no kind of sense, right? Well, Reuben was Malcolm's official bodyguard, and he was paid by a group of people, $65 a week, to look out for Malcolm. Another diversionary tactic that was employed at the Autobahn Ballroom while Malcolm was being shot were the flashing lights mounted above that were flashing on and off at random flashing rates via remote control from a miniature momentary contact push-button switch. This switch was operated from a ballroom booth seat that was facing the stage. The device was hardwired from the booth to the stage and hidden under a seat. The switch was manually pushed to activate the stage lights to go on and off in unison with the muzzle flash from the weapons of the standing assassins firing at Malcolm. 
The purpose of this procedure was to create an impression that other assassins were firing from another location. This served to create bewilderment, shock and awe, chaos and confusion to all witnesses even further than the horror they were experiencing. The flashing light method had CIA, black ops, black bag written all over it. Two men were sitting in the booth that I was sitting in, very well dressed with a tape. So, you know, I just, you know, everybody, you know, brings tapes and whatnot, because usually they didn't allow us to have no tapes in there, no cameras. The acoustic evidence was sabotaged because the existing recording of the actual assassination was not recorded directly into the TX model A1200 reel-to-reel -reel deck that was set up at the front of the stage. The deck was set up to record at a speed of 3 3 inches per second on Scotch brand Type 200 reel-to-reel -reel tape on 7-inch reels. The deck was directly connected to a Shure Model 55 SW Unidyne 2 unidirectional microphone that had a crisp sounding extremely intelligible frequency response from 50 to 15,000 hertz. At the base of the microphone was a on-off switch. This microphone in its day was a state-of-the-art component that was employed widely for its superb sound pickup characteristics and rugged dependability. The acoustic evidence of the existing recording of the assassination is of inferior quality because the sound pickup was not directly captured into the equipment set up on the stage but was recorded from a portable battery operated tape recorder by an audience spectator. The hollow, distant-sounding, existing recording confirms this. So what I have is what we're living in very, very changing times. And what will be today might not be tomorrow. And without any further ado, I bring before you a sense of album, and I pray that you and I will listen, listen, hear, and understand. Thank you. Eyewitnesses to the murder say that Malcolm never touched the microphone when he came forward to speak. The microphone wasn't even connected to the reel-to-reel -reel tape deck on stage. On the morning of the assassination, team number one prepare for their mission by smoking hashes to induce a state of euphoria to provide a taste of the delights of paradise awaiting their success. Additionally, the narcotic will help make the killers impervious to pain in case they are captured by Malcolm's followers and beaten to death. Why was it that two innocent men ended up going to prison. You know, Butler and Johnson didn't no more kill Malcolm than I killed Malcolm. I was five years old when Malcolm was killed. Uh, and of course, now, Goldman deals with that, though, by saying that the NYPD simply got the wrong men. Um, the problem with that is, is that we have um, several people, and probably most importantly, uh, a man by the name of Ronald, Ronald Timberlake, who was one of the star witnesses during the trial. And in, in his testimony, you know, they, they first cleared the court because he claimed that his life was in danger. But anyway, in 1980, he was interviewed for 60 Minutes, and he said that the police lineup at which he identified Butler was, con you know, was contrived, was a phony, a setup by members of the NYPD. And, of course, Goldman, unfortunately, because, you know, he got very close to the police on the, you know, case, you know, who were investigating Malcolm's assassination, you know, Goldman you know, had nothing but plaudits for them. You know, they did a great job on a difficult circumstance, et cetera, et cetera. But the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, is that they did a very inadequate job as far as the, in, the investigation is concerned. And as Timberlake has basically alluded to, because I have, if you read the trial transcript too, by the way, one other witness, a man by the name of Davis, he also talks about the police lineup when he identified Butler. And based upon what he said, it was an incredible setup. You know, in fact, I, I would just let you, t you know, know real quickly how he did it. He said that what happened was he was brought into this room and it was connected to another room that had just a peephole. Now, one of the things that the NYPD did in order to, to actually frame Butler 
is one of the assassins, the person who had the 38, he had a, a salt and pepper tweed. He wore a salt and pepper tweed, which a few witnesses talked about after the assassination. Butler happened to have a similar coat. What they did was they had Butler, when he was in the police lineup, to wear that salt and pepper tweed, which is very unusual, you know. But at the same time, they also had five or six police detectives, black police detectives and, you know, cops in plain clothes, who were also part of the police lineup. And this is what this man, Davis, when he testified in the trial, he said this is what he was told. He said, what we want you to do is to look into the room and see whether or not you see the man who, you know, who you remember sitting, you know, you know, as, you know, as one of the assassins of Malcolm. But he said that what happened was when he looked into the thing, into the peephole, the person who was with him, you know, the supervisor or whatever the hell he was, he said, is Butler the man in the tweed coat that you saw shoot Malcolm? He said, yeah, fine, that's it. In other words, you have just led this person. You didn't say, so tell me, so, you know, does anything look familiar? In other words, you gave presidential, you know, prejudicial, presidential information. That's ridiculous. You don't do something like that in a police lineup. But apparently this is what Timberlake, apparently this is what happened with, with Timberlake as well, and this is apparently what he's alluding to when he said the police lineup was contrived. And the whole key, you know, I think, more than anything, was that damn coat. If he had on any other coat, it's not clear if that person would have identified Butler. And again, you're basically leading the witnesses when you do stuff like that. You're not supposed to do something like that, unless all of them had on the same coat or something like that. So anyway, those were the types of games, you know, that was, um, you know, basically being played. While Malcolm X was being taken out of the ballroom on a stretcher, someone in the crowd can be seen who appears to be Norman 3X Butler. It has been said repeatedly that Butler was not inside the ballroom, but was he outside the ballroom? Here is footage of the crime scene. Observe a man in a black hat and tweed coat. Though his back is turned, the person's profile certainly resembles Butler. Now, the same scene uninterrupted with a white arrow pointing to the person in question. Oddly enough, one of the assassins who fired a 38 handgun killing Malcolm, Leon Davis, wore a salt and pepper tweed coat just like Butler's. On the day of the assassination, Butler had visited his doctor for a foot injury. The doctor instructed Butler to go straight home. But before going home, Butler stopped by Temple No. 7's restaurant. Was the person observed outside the ballroom Butler? Was it one of the assassins, or was it a planted double? The autopsy report of page two at the Smoking Gun website lists an exit wound of Malcolm's left middle back and three recovered shotgun pellets from the right side of Malcolm's back. Worthy of note is that the autopsy is incomplete. Oddly enough, three spent shotgun shells are displayed at the site. The unexplained appearance of the third shotgun shell is the one that was used to shoot Malcolm in his back. There were certain people that need to be there that day wasn't there, and I've questioned them about it, and I said something to Gene a long time ago. I said, don't you ever tell me again that a man is a man because he has a third leg. Let me tell you something. I've stepped over men that day who were supposed to be men, okay? Stepped over them. They were on the floor, all right? And that upset me terrible because these were the front guard. You know, how are you going to be laying on the floor? This is your brother. You say you're going to give your life for your brother. You know, like your word. I give you my word. 
I'll die before I break my word. But the bottom line was that because of this power struggle, Elijah Muhammad is, is ultimately going to, you know, participate. And when he participated, Malcolm is going to be the odd man out.